Well, all right, let's go ahead and open in prayer and then we'll go ahead and jump into tonight's lesson. We have a lot to cover. Heavenly Father, God in heaven, you know all things. You know our distresses, you know our frustrations, our pain. You know our happiness and our desires. And tonight we uh, we, we keep the Coral family in mind, Bob and, um, and all the family they have there. Uh, we pray that they have a, um, a solid continuation of understanding of who you are, what you've done, and to be able to rely upon your truth in times of difficulty and help us to be there for them and with them in great need. And um, as we uh, say goodbye, say so long to a dear friend. We know that she is safe with you, and we are, are looking forward to the day we are, meet up again. As for tonight, Lord, we, we pray that we, we study well, that we take in your word, that we consider all that you have written so that we may be able to understand who you are better and that we can have that influence how we think and use it for your purposes. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 26. We are getting there. We are running into the end of the last portion of the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 26 to 28, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There's obviously more content within there than that, but that's the main thrust. It is the end. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing uh, Matthew 26, 1 through 16, the plot to kill Jesus solidified. But before that, I want to make sure we kind of go over where we've been and where we're going from here. As the narrative section uh, kind of picks up, we will be spending less time in specific areas. Obviously, the Olivet Discourse, we had to dispel some issues and and, um, and, and go over some specifics. Um, but now we'll be able to pick up. Now, I will, of course, stop at certain points and kind of dig into certain areas. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at about 13, 14 lessons, and we'll be done with the book of Matthew, minus any introductions, of course. So first and foremost, Matthew is a narrative written with a particular purpose. Now, those purposes can be manifold, but the primary one is that of understanding that Jesus is the Messiah through the recording of history by Matthew in two ways, narratives and discourses. Uh, we have concluded the fifth and final discourse in Matthew. Now, discourse is not just where he speaks or other people speak, but actually elongated periods of information that are put there specifically for the enhancement of understanding that Jesus is the Messiah and what he has planned to do. The first discourse is in Matthew 5 through 7, which we call Sermon on the Mount. Um, the second discourse is Matthew 10, where we talk about the discipleship of Jesus. Now, that's not how we are disciples. We discuss that fully, but that is actually how Jesus called them to be disciples, and it was very costly. We will talk... Um, Eventually, we will talk about discipleship in the church at some point, and I'll let you know it's not the same. You can't go to Matthew 10 to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ today. That's, it's, be, it's improper. The third discourse is found in Matthew 13, and that's the parables of Jesus, where they're all uh, compiled and put together. It's not all the parables he speaks, but it is primarily the ones that were part of, I consider it to be part of the lessons in conjunction with the Sermon on the Mount. The fourth discourse is Matthew 18. That's greatness in the kingdom. That's talking about, and again, it's about a lot of people take this as how to be a really good Christian. And I think there are some parallels with how to be a, a, a good, a quote unquote, Christian. But that's not about what this is about. This is about greatness in the kingdom. We're not talking about the church. Now, do we get, it's always difficult because you, with the disclaimer, People think that it's pointless to even read. No, there are principles found within all these discourses. We have to be very careful about how to apply it to our lives. We can't understand what God generally likes and dislikes. And we just concluded the fifth discourse, Matthew 23 through 25, the Olivet Discourse. Um, and I hope that you found that helpful and, and, and enlightening in some aspects. And, and somewhat, I, a lot of people have said, that they found it comforting knowing what it really means, and it's a lot easier to explain now. Before, between, and after these discourses, the narrative progresses from location to location and records the conversations, the challenges, the miracles, and the wisdom of Jesus the Messiah. 
the narrative sections complete this encounter of Matthew. So if all you had was a discourse, you'd have a lot, but you wouldn't have the complete story. Within the account of Matthew, you have his birth and early life, chapters 1 through 2. Then you have his introduction to Israel, and we get that in chapters 3 through 4, beginning with the temptations of Jesus Christ and going into some of his early uh, miracles, getting people's attention. Then, of course, after this is where we have the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing he says in dealing with his wisdom. Afterwards, you deal with chapter 8 through 9, and that is his miracles, where he displays the characteristics of being the Messiah in his activity. He does tremendous things in which they have never seen before. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. After his miracles, he has another, the discipleship uh, discourse in Matthew 10. Then you come to Matthew 11 through 12, and you see some affirmation and opposition. Affirmation from various towns and different people in various different locations about that he is the Messiah. But then you also start seeing opposition uh, uh, pile up in which you have the Pharisees now having their strategy known, claiming that he is acting and his actions are from Beelzebub, the prince of demons. In chapter 13, you have the parables. And then the and the chapter 14 through 17, more evidence of Jesus' messiahship and more opposition. So more evidence, more opposition. It keeps on building. And you can see that the the it's kind of building up this crescendo, this point of reference, which we're obviously getting to very shortly. Chapter 18 is the fourth discourse. And then it picks up in the narrative of chapter 19 through 22, Jesus' Judean ministry. And that Judean ministry, we find that he is moving away from Galilee and heading to Jerusalem, the Judean ministry, where it lasts about six months. In the Judean ministry, we talked about this before, um, this is not his first time in Judea. However, Matthew records this as the kind of the finalization of his plan. Um did he spend, this is probably the most amount of time he spent in Judea during his ministry sessions. Otherwise, he would come and go, usually for the festivals. I always find that very interesting because John focuses on Judean ministry and having three trips to Jerusalem. I find that very, very interesting. And then, of course, where we are now, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Again, there's more content here. In fact, before we get into the actual content... Let's go over, if you will, have your Bibles open. We'll kind of skim through chapters 26 to 28 and kind of get an overview, find out where we're going, see how long it's going to take us, and see how well we're, uh, we're prepared for it. As always, I always encourage you to read ahead, to get ahead of me, to make observations, ask questions. And therefore, since I'm able to answer my own questions, perhaps I answer your questions. If I don't, that gives you fodder for saying, hey, Will, you didn't cover something I'm interested in and allows me to kind of help you out as you continue to study on your own. The first point in Matthew 20 and Matthew 26, 28 is the plan solidified. And that the plan is about his crucifixion. And obviously what he doesn't, um, they're not part of the plan though. The, the, the rulers are not part of the plan of his resurrection, but the plan of his crucifixion, his death on the cross is being solidified by all. We'll talk about that shortly in full detail. Afterwards, you had the last Passover, chapter 26, verses 17 through 30. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the Lord's Supper, and obviously we, um, we honor that by remembering it. We'll talk about what this is intended here and what, what they are to do here and why it's, why it's kind of different um, in Matthew than it is, for example, in, in, uh, in how we should understand it according to our own practices. So we'll do a little bit of compare and contrast with the last Passover and specifically the Lord's Supper. I don't like calling it Lord's Supper, but everyone does. Therefore, eh, no sense changing over all of our uh, all of our words. In chapter twenty-six, verse thirty-one to thirty-five, you have Jesus predicts the failing of his disciples. Now, this isn't just Peter, although Peter is the focus. I find it interesting because Peter is the de facto leader. He's the oldest, probably the oldest one. And he is, according to Acts, when they first start out, he is the main focus point. So he is going to be a focal point there as within this particular passage. But it says, I, I, when I go, everyone's going to scatter. And Peter's like, not me. And Jesus says, particularly you. 
So I, I find that very interesting because like, again, you know, it's everyone is failing, but Peter steps up and says, not me. But then he specifically points out Peter in the atrocities that he's going to do in his denials. It's not just he believes, but he denies. And that's again, it's a big deal. We'll talk about the remedy for that, by the way, what happened afterwards. And we'll, we'll compare and contrast briefly that at John chapter 21, where he asks, do you love me? Is not reinstating Peter. It already happened after uh, before that time. The fourth point of uh, the section is the Garden of Gethsemane, in which obviously we, we, we are familiar with the shows, TV shows, or even reading it. Occasionally we'll, we'll read this information. And the events that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus goes to pray. The disciples are stayed behind. Um, and remember, they do that kind of tier system where they leave most of the disciples over here. And then three of them come a little bit closer with Jesus. Then Jesus goes off a little bit farther away. And Jesus commissions them to stay awake and pray. And they don't. And Jesus does this a couple different times. He comes back to them. Wake up. I, I, I have to ask a question there. Like, you know, if he knows they're sleeping, why the emphasis? Just to contrast them, to get them to know that they're failing, to help them understand that they have to conquer the flesh in order to be able to take on what the spirit desires. I don't know. Very interesting. Then you have the arrest of Jesus, you know, the uh, uh, where where Jesus is betrayed by the betrayer, bringing a cohort of Roman soldiers. We find that very interesting. We we'll get into some details, seeing it from all perspectives, and hopefully be able to come away with some solid conclusions. Maybe some things that you didn't notice before. Then we get into the trials. Now, where where Matthew has two, John has three, and Luke throws in a, I think an additional one. I have to double check my 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 memory. Um, Matthew only has two main trials. Um, Jesus before the Sanhedrin in 26, 54 through 68. Uh, John, before they even gets to Caiaphas, goes to Anna, to Annas. So Matthew skips some details here. And I, and I think that the reason why is because the main point of emphasis is that he is found guilty before the Sanhedrin. That's the big issue where John gets a little bit more descriptive. Uh, some people say that John was probably within eyesight or within ear earshot of what's happening there, which is a possibility. And then you have the uh, the actual happening of, G of Peter denying Jesus in 26, 69 through 75, where he is actually confronted. And he even, um, uh, according to all their uh, compile compilation of the entire text, that he begins to even curse and swear, which is much worse than denial. I love that. He even cursed. Oh, OK. Well, that's that's the problem. Hmm. I thought it was the denial part, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's good to curse, but at the same time, you know, that's a lot of people like focus on that point. I find that hilarious. Chapter uh, chapter 27, verses 1 through 10 begins with Judas's sorrow. Now, we'll, we'll have to dispel some misnomers here. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, why would he be sorry unless he didn't believe? Uh, we'll, we'll confront that. Um, and we'll we'll talk about exactly what, Ju what Judas's sorrow was about and why he is still according to scripture, not in heaven. He is lost. He is not a believer. Some people right now are like, well, you can't just say that and leave me waiting. I'm like, yes, I can. It's going to take me at least eight weeks before I get there. Then you have Jesus before Pilate, 27, 11 to 26, in which we're going to discuss this in a little bit more depth. Um, I did this in our Christology classes, but I really wanted to dig into this a little bit more. Jesus before Pilate brings out something that I think needs to be explored because there are a couple other passages in the epistles where it talks about that he made the good confession before Pilate. And that's still kind of like it, it, it irks me a little bit. I, I don't really fully um, think we grasp everything that's being stated there. So what is this conversation that he has with Pilate? And I think we also need to go over to the other Gospels to really understand this fully. So we're going to obviously focus in on Matthew. We're going to look at the other other uh, uh, accounts and try to figure out and be able to answer what is this good confession? What is he actually saying here that is so uh, upheld as a, as a solid statement before Pilate? Chapter uh, 2727 begins the crucifixion. Now, the crucifixion begins with scourging, and then you have the death. And then I'm going to teach on the significance, of course. You cannot have the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
and not talk about what it means. That is so valuable. Matthew, the, the Gospels really don't get into the significance of the death of Christ. It get You can start to learn about the significance of the death of Christ in Acts and in the epistles. We know what it means, but when it, when it talks about here within the text, it really doesn't discuss all of the different implications of his death. Now, I'm not saying that's a mistake, but I'm not going to sit there and let that just be stated that he died on the cross and then not talk about what for and what the overall outcome of that is. So we'll talk about the significance in detail. So the crucifixion is a place where we may actually stop and, and kind of deep dive even more into the text to make sure that we understand all of the contents as well as the significance. Okay. Obviously, there. Um, I think um, Matthew pays specific attention to the burial um, in 57 through 50, uh, not 57 through 55. That's not right. 57 through 59, I think it is. Oh, for 66. Huh? Oh. So it's supposed to be a 6 6, not a 5 5 there. So Matthew, 50, tw Matthew 27, 57 through 66, <laughs> dealing with the burial. Um, so we're going to, again, give that its proper due. Um, it's very interesting in, in Corinthians where it says the, the, the primary information about the person of Jesus Christ is that Jesus died on the cross for sins was buried and rose again so there's a there's a there's a, a significance to the burial that we often negate or not negate but don't really pay enough attention to why is this attention to the burial so important let's go ahead and discuss that i want to get to that section and finally the resurrection point number 12 28 1 through 10 uh, well, again, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the significance as well in dealing with the resurrection. The content's pretty easy. Again, I always find this very interesting in the Bible that, you know, the, the biggest thing that's ever happened, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is told ma rarely, very matter-of-factly in the Gospels. You would think they would sit down and ponder these things, that you would write over and commentary and every, all kinds of information and all the different ideas that, that kind of come along with that. But they really just, just stated this is what happened. Same thing we're dealing with the birth of Jesus Christ, right? You get all the different the lead up, you know, the, the, the uh, conception and all the different things that happened before that and a couple of things that happened afterwards. But the actual birth of Jesus Christ is she gave birth to a baby. That, that's it. If you more information, please. If that's so, it's a lot of the details that surround the information around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that are more important as far as theological goes. In the content, it's simply just a step matter of fact. Then you have an interesting section here on verses 11 through 15 dealing with the conspiracy. And this is how we're going to go ahead and explain this away. And you can tell that politics has always been politics. Whenever something that goes that doesn't go the way you want it to, and you have to spin it. And so they spin this to their own uh, desires. And I love how it ends there. And it says, um, and it's widely spread among the Jews and to this day. To this day, in other words, I mean, of course, we know that according to the writing of this. But it's very interesting that a couple even years afterwards, this is the, this is the story they tell. And this is the story they're sticking to. And then finally... The last section, 28, 16 through 20, the commission. Now, is it the great commission? Is it the somewhat great commission? We have to talk about this in regards to who it's being spoken to, what the purpose of it was, has it been fulfilled? Are we responsible for continuation of this particular commission? All right. So that's the overview. 14 major points. Obviously, the crucifixion is going to be in the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is going to be a major focal point. Uh, but other details are going to be there. A couple of these points may be kind of combined on a particular Wednesday. What I'll tell you is this. That's probably going to be at least 14, maybe looking at 15, 16. So we're looking at about four months. Um, in fact, if everything works out well, I'll be running around the resurrection right around Easter. I didn't plan it. But that's kind of cool. All right. So that's the plan. Uh, we'll look forward to that. I hope that you, I, I've wet your whistle a little bit, kind of get you going. Again, I would I would ask that, you know, on your Wednesdays before you come in or during the week in between, give it a read. Write down observations. 
ask some questions. Let's get down to some of the nitty gritty and hopefully we'll be able to get the information out as much as possible. All right. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 26. So we'll start beginning with our text, looking at the content of this particular, the plan to kill Jesus litified. Matthew 26, 1 is a very interesting passage, which talks, which basically begins with when Jesus finished all these words. Uh, Matthew 26, 1 is a book, um, is the book, the bookmark, the bookend to indicate that he's transitioning from discourse to narrative. Do I think that he understood this when he was writing it? Yes, I do. I think that people do this all the time. They have a particular way of saying something in order to be able to establish I'm moving away from this discourse and going into actual, uh, you know, simple narrative. Um, the phrase itself is right here. And when Jesus had completed this now in this particular section it says all these words now that's not what we're focusing on we're focusing on the actual greek phrase here this exact greek phrase in the exact order in the exact same grammatical form is found four other times so at this one five times the book of matthew and you will find it at the end of each discourse you have it in matthew 7 28 where it says when jesus had finished these words the crowds were amazed at his teaching that's the end of the of the first discourse, which is the uh, the Sermon on the Mount. At the end of Matthew chapter eleven, verse uh, not the end, but the eleven chapter eleven, verse one. This is the end of the discourse on discipleship for his disciples when Jesus had finished giving instructions. Now again, it's not giving instructions. They they added this in here because of additional words that are there. But the actual phrase there, when Jesus had completed this, the instructions. To his 12 disciples. Then you have it at 1353. When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. Now, again, it says when Jesus had finished this, the parables, he departed from there. Now, I always find it very interesting because the, tra the, the, the diversification is not consistent. Shouldn't this be at the end of every chapter? If you're going to have a chapter break, Shouldn't this verse, that con that content, be at the end of each discourse, not at the beginning of a new chapter? You have it in chapter 11, verse 1, 728, 1353, 19-1, and then now a 26-1. It's very, it's very inconsistent with how you go ahead and uh, bookmark these places. It's also, of course, in, in Matthew 19 one when Jesus had finished these words. This is almost exactly the exact words from Matthew 26-1, where he says, when Jesus had finished all these words. So bookends, always great to go through the text, find uh, phrases and words that are repeated so you can see structure a little bit easier. They have ways of writing. They have ways of being able to communicate it properly. And this is just one of those areas in which we can look at this and say, this is exactly how he's communicating in both discourses and narratives. It's used consistently at the end of every discourse to, dis to distinguish um, sections that he has purposely put in there. It as if he would put in there uh, a solid break or, or, you know, even a blank page before he turned it. Then it comes to Matthew 26, verse 2, where he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. So first and foremost, Jesus gives the timetable. This is two days prior to the Passover. Passover is when he's crucified. He said uh, he and it gives you questions about that. We'll get to the timing aspect a little bit later. Uh, right now, we just know that it's two days out from the Passover. He is 48 hours to 36 hours away from being crucified, depending upon your time, how, how that's timed out. Jesus indicates that in two days, basically, he is going to be handed over for crucifixion. Now, handed over is a very important word. It is paradidomai. Paradidomai um, means hand over, turn over, or give up a person, or to transfer someone or something over to another's authority. Because we have read this already, because we already know the entire account, we know how, what this means. It's not simply about Judas, because Judas didn't hand him over for crucifixion. Who handed Jesus over for crucifixion? The Jewish authorities. And so you have various different avenues of being handed over. 
Judas, the betrayer, handed over Jesus to the Jewish authorities. The Jewish authorities took him and basically put him on trial and condemned him. They didn't want to get, you know, basically in, out of favor with the people by, cruci by, by killing someone, stoning someone while everyone was there. They didn't want to create a riot. So they handed him over to Pilate and to the Romans for crucifixion. This handing over for crucifixion is a very important concept because the Jews did not crucify people. So crucifixion here is uh, starao, and this word literally means to be placed on a cross. It is the verb form of the noun cross. So how do you, it's not, you're not crossing somebody, you are placed upon that cross. Now in English, we have an issue because if you're like, oh, they're crucifying me, you don't mean ever literally right? Normally when people say they're headed over for crucifixion, even if they're um, fully aware that he's on the cross in this text, they are oftentimes read this to basically be treated unjustly. In English, to crucify someone means to treat somebody with gross injustice, an unfair persecution, the, the, the injustice and the per, and the unfairness are attached to this word in meaning and how we use the word. We don't ever talk about crucifixion as a just penalty. That is an unjust penalty. So because we have this word in English, we always need to make sure that we, pro, we, we deal with it appropriately. Again, number one, the word itself to be placed on a cross is does not convey injustice or unfairness in fact what does the thief on the cross say to the other thief we are getting what we deserve this man so they're being crucified and he recognizes we're getting what we're supposed to get was crucifixion unnecessarily brutal i would say so was it probably the coolest way to die 100 percent was it unjust for the for various different cultures to use crucifixion to execute someone no and this is the difference okay the practice of placing somebody on a cross was not a temporary punishment you didn't put somebody on a, on, a, on a cross and go okay stay there for a couple hours we'll bring you down afterwards you're there you're there till you're dead okay or they kill you it was the most brutal punishment. It was a death sentence. It was most commonly used in the most public locations as so as to deter people from creating rebellion or other criminal activity. It is infamous, of course, and brutal methods of, ex of execution. But remember, they didn't have the, the Geneva Codes, you know, you know, any type of the ideas of torture. Uh, now, if they're going to torture somebody, they just don't do it publicly anymore. It may have been used by the Persians. I think there's pretty good evidence of the Persians using this before the Romans. That crucifixion hanging on a hanging on a tree, hanging on a on a wood post until dead was not something that the Romans invented. However, I think they perfected it based upon the research. They did it well. So again, execution by placed on upon a cross was used by Persians and perfected by the Romans. But also being hung on a tree was not uncommon to Israel. It's not like Israel going, wait, what are you guys doing? You're hanging people on trees? That's kind of crazy. No, this happened all the time. It's even back to Genesis chapter 40, verse 19, where it says, within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree. Egypt was hanging people on trees. Now, notice he's already taken his head. Within this culture, Hanging somebody on a tree was done not as the formal aspect of execution, but rather done as a display after you're executed. It's like putting your head on a pike and then putting it around the town. Okay, the death was the beheading, not the pudding. Okay, the so putting on the tree was a open display that this person has been executed for further shame. In Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, it talks about. Uh, kind of an assumption it does and nowhere in scripture does it say they have to do this but if they did there was rules 
if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree. So the common idea here is a person got stoned to death or got killed with a sword and he did so rightfully. Oftentimes, Israel would put them on a tree. Now they say tree. Do I mean a literal tree? Do I think they're in the practice of, of manufacturing out of wood a display little tree? Probably not. They probably actually pinned them right to a tree. His corpse shall not hang all night on the tree. But you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he was hanged as a curse of God. This verse is actually always used of Jesus Christ being a curse for us because he hung on a tree. So that you do not defile your land, because the land will be defiled if a person stays on the cross, on the tree, for longer than evening. Interesting enough, in Joshua chapter 10, okay, afterward, Joshua struck, this is after the rebellion of the five kings. They defeated the five kings. They brought the five kings out. Joshua struck them with the sword, and struck them was basically with death blow, and put them to death, and he hung them on five trees. And they hung on the trees until evening, and then at sunset they went and got them to, com to comply with the instruction in Deuteronomy 21. And so this whole idea of hanging somebody on a tree or on a cross was not unusual to the Jews, it, but it was not the method of execution. So they were actually, I would say, more humane with this. They threw him a rock party or they killed him with the sword. That's how they would kill them, which is quicker. Okay, just kill them. Where the Romans and the Persians, they like the idea of this hanging on a tree thing. And you're just going to hang there until dead. They were, in my evaluation, malicious. They liked the torture. So... When Jesus states that he will be handed over for crucifixion, he is not simply stating that he is going to be turned over to the Jewish authorities, although that's true. Rather, he is indicating that he will be handed over to the Romans who will do the final act of execution by means of crucifixion. Okay? So the reason I'm harping on this is because Jesus is being very specific with his method of dying. Before he said, I'm going to die. Now, if you go back to the text, this is the first time he mentions, I'm going to die by crucifixion. This brings us to Matthew 26, 3 through 5, in which now the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were not, but they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. They don't they really didn't care about what was a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, they didn't want to do it during the Passover because you know they were trying to be all pious and, and righteous. No, there's just a lot of people there. And the more people that are that are typically there, especially outside of Jerusalem, because they control a lot of the people within Jerusalem, there was bigger chance of uprise. So they wanted to do it at a different period of time. Now, it's very interesting because you look at this text and you deal with it and go, the popularity of Jesus, the direct confrontation that he's had against them, the miracles, all that put together, especially if you read the book of John, what are we going to do? This guy's doing so many miracles. This is what they say. He's doing so many miracles that if we don't put him to stop him, he's going to take away everything from us. You would think with so many miracles, they may go, who is this guy? But they don't. They're more consumed with and concerned about their position and their power. So the entire leadership council, notice this isn't the Pharisees. Notice this isn't the Sadducees or the, or the scribes. This is everybody, including the elders. Who are the elders? They're always the representatives of people. Nothing is done without the basically the elders say so. Were they corrupt? Most likely. Were they deceived? Probably too. But they were in hearty agreement with not only putting to Jesus by to death, but putting the death by stealth. Stealth. 
interesting word. Did they put to Jesus? Did they put Jesus to death by stealth? Um, they but they they went and got him in Gethsemane with six hundred men. That wasn't very stealthy. They brought him before the now they had the nighttime trials. You know they get it done quickly, or they want to do it. In, are they doing it in secret? Maybe. But then what? Pilate brought him out before all the people, and with all the people say, "Crucify." That's not that's not stealthy. Then they hung him on a cross, knowing who turned him over to to Pilate. Now perhaps they were trying to diminish their responsibility by having the Romans do it, but nothing was done in secret, right? Stealth is actually the word dalos. Dalos is actually taking advantage through craft and underhanded methods. Now, normally, when you're being crafty, you're being secretive because of obviously if you're letting everybody know your methods, you're not getting fooled. But the main point of emphasis here is the deceit and the treachery. Their plan was that they would arrest and kill Jesus by lying about him. This is what the word stealth means. It doesn't mean secret, although there was some secret aspects to it. But this word means to lie. In Matthew 26, 59 through 61, the trials, the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they might put him to death. They're trying to fit, they're trying to drum up charges. And they keep on trying. And look what happens. They did not find any. They kept on trying to bring in false witnesses. And they keep on trying to trap him. Jesus is deflecting all of this. I, don't, I think, honestly, that nothing's holding up because obviously it's not true. But I think there might have been some things there that are actually being supernaturally dealt with. Now, very interesting. Okay. Afterwards, two came forward. <laughs> he said this openly. He said this to some Pharisees. This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Now, we find this at the statement in, made in John, right? And we obviously had the disciples' record of that, but he meant the temple of his body, which was true. Why would this be a cause for their, his death? I'll let you know, it's not. This question, okay, is used to kind of like allow Jesus to give them the proper reason for his death. This is not the reason. This is, this is the main lie that they're used to catalyst. But if you continue reading, and when we get there, we'll obviously expand this more, that they use this in order to basically say, Jesus, are you the Christ? Yes. Okay, now you're dead. The reason why he is put on the cross, he is handed over to the Romans, is because he makes himself out to be an authority over Israel. You're the Christ, the King, the Son of God. That's why. They say it's for blasphemy to claim with God. No, they put him on that cross because they said, we have no king but Caesar. Ah, see, they want you get down to the aspect of these people. They're not even trying to use a religious blasphemy against him. They say it, but the main reason why they asked Pilate to crucify him was because he makes himself out to be a king. And so the truth, not a lie, the truth is what is used to crucify Jesus. They put him on trial. They arrested him, and their attempts was to lie about him. Very interesting. They also say they don't want to do it during the festival. Now, it, it tells you why they don't want to do it during the festival. Because a riot might occur. We don't want a riot to occur, so therefore, not during the festival. Now, the festival was the unleavened bread and Passover. It's not just the day of Passover, but they have a, a week-long celebration there where people are coming and going into Jerusalem. Remember how many people were there during Passover? I think Josephus numbered it in the two millions. There's a lot of people going in and out during Passover. 
And so when you have that many people, the normal population, I think, was around the 100,000 to 120,000 number. You get 120,000 normal, and then all of a sudden you get 2 million people. How difficult is that to control? Very difficult. So therefore, not during Passover, not during the festivals. But they did. They did crucify him during the Passover festivals. What changed? Now, we understand what changed literally. God orchestrated for him to be crucified on Passover. But what changed for the Sanhedrin, for the leadership council? What gave them the opportunity to do so? Judas. Judas is like, and when we get who sent out Judas? Who sent out Judas to betray him? Jesus. It's like, again, Jesus could have waited until after the Passover and said, okay, you know, and just waited for Judas to do it. But he goes, no, leave, go do what you're going to do. And basically tells him, I think in uncertain terms, where to find me. After they have Passover, they get up to Gethsemane. They go there. Judas knows this is where he's going to be. When people talk about, you know, the, the, who's responsible for the death of Jesus Christ, we can hold Judas accountable. We can hold the Sanhedrin and the leadership council accountable. We can hold Pilate and the Romans who actually did the deed accountable. But who's the one who's really responsible for his death? Jesus is responsible for his death, and the Father planned it. All, all are part of it. Jesus and the Father, righteous. The other ones, unrighteous. They were unable to demonstrate a sin of Jesus, but they used the truth to crucify him. In Matthew 26, 6 to 13, we have a, a passage here dealing with Mary anointing Jesus. Now, it doesn't say Mary and Matthew, but we do know that it is her through John. So it said, now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came up with, uh, came to him with alabaster vial and very costly perfume. She poured it on his head, and he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant. Is it that word? They were very mad, <laughs> indignant. Thank you. Never I will get that word right on a, my first try. When they saw this, they said, why this waste for this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor? But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did, not, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world. What this woman has done will also be spoken in memory of her. Hmm. Now, in, Ma in Matthew 26, how many days away are they from the Passover? Two, right? In John chapter 12, verses, verse 1, it says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took the pound of very costly perfume and pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his hair, his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Same situation, six days out. Is this two different situations? I don't think so. I think that the Matthew recording is out of chronological order. So after we make some observations, we have to ask, if it's out of chronological order, why is it placed here? Right? And he could have easily written that before he did the, the Olivet Discourse, which was during that last couple, that last week. Before the Olivet Discourse, Mary anointed Jesus and Bethany. He had not returned back to Bethany for a week. Now, first and foremost, so we'll ask the question. So we're going to ask that question: Why is this here if it's out of chronological order? Whenever you recognize that, that's always a valuable question to ask. All right. So they were at having dinner at Simon the leper's house, 
But Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were eating with Jesus at Simon the leper, whom he healed earlier, by the way. The woman who came to Jesus is Mary and took very costly perfume and poured it on his head. In John, it also mentions his feet. Matthew does not specify how costly or the kind of perfume, but the parallels in Mark 14, 5 and John 12, 5 tells us that this is pure nard, probably from India. If it weighed 12 ounces, and we got that number also from the reverse engineering from John, it had been worth 300 denarii. 300 denarii is about a year's wage. So Mary had this very costly perfume, and then she used it to anoint Jesus, and that could have been used or sold or whatever for a year's worth of wages. I don't know how many people in here have a perfume that's worth a year's worth of wages. Even if you go ahead and say well, your most expensive thing that you have, is it a worth a year's worth of wages? Maybe your maybe your house, you know, that type of that kind of concept. But very few of us have any type of possession that's worth that much money. Not a different economy, of course. Now, after rebuking Judas's objection, Judas' objection specifically in John, the disciples' objection in Matthew, I think they all had their objections, Jesus explains that she had done a good thing. What she did, she has done to prepare me for burial. Hmm. Hmm. The act of perfuming a body was normally done after they're dead. Not before. I say normally. I don't think I have ever heard of any other situation where somebody was prepared for death while they're still alive. But as we will discover later, Mary comes to do this again after his death. But she doesn't get the opportunity. So either insight supernatural inspiration or something caused her to do this before his death. Hmm. And this leads me to a question. Does she do this knowingly or unknowingly? Does she do this? And then Jesus goes, she's doing this for my burial. And she goes, wait a second, I wasn't doing that for burial. I just wanted to you know, make it smell a little better. He's a man He's walking around a lot. So is it knowingly or unknowingly? Remember, Jesus had been speaking about his death for some time now. His disciples are going, what does he mean he's going to die? I think Mary knows he's going to die soon. I think that he's talking about it regularly with them. Remember the conversation to Jesus, they're recorded for our benefit in the book. How often is he talking about this with his disciples? Probably on a more regular basis. They still don't get it. I think Mary got it. And because he's the Lord, because he's the Messiah, because she's already seen Lazarus raised from the dead, you know what? She's thinking, maybe, I'm, I'm speculating a little bit here, so don't take this as the you know biblical truth. Here, you're going to die, but you're going to pop right back up again. And your death is important, otherwise you wouldn't. So therefore, I'm going to anoint you now. So I believe, I am convinced, that Mary knew, understood that Jesus was speaking literally and honored Jesus in preparation for his death. Took that opportunity. I have it right here. I'm with you now. Let me go ahead and do it now. Now, we've already talked about this. But since this is out of chronological order, we must ask, why is this recorded here? Hmm. Why, why is it here? And it's in between what? It's in between the leadership plot and the Judas plot. Why? Why is it in why is it breaking that up? Is it just for you know changing the scenes type of thing? No. I think it because it falls in line with the plot. 
It's stated here because everyone is in agreement that Jesus is going to die. Jesus states it openly. The elders are recorded as making this deal that they're going to do it. Obviously, skipping this, Judas then agrees to betray him. And Mary, as a representative of, his, of the believers, also anoint him for his death. It's all in alignment with the death plot. The plot to crucify Jesus is not one of the Jewish leadership in Jesus alone, and Judas alone. Jesus, the Father, and now Mary are all in on the plan. <clears throat> I think that Mary knowingly declared that Jesus would be killed, and I also think that this is the reason why she's honored. Now, remember, this isn't Mary, mother of Jesus, that this is Mary, the sister of Martha, sister of Lazarus. And she is honored. Says whenever the people tell this gospel, what gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, is she will also come to mind. That the history of what she did to, to Jesus is going to be one of the main focal points of his death, that she anointed him before his death as a sign that she understood and was in agreement. This brings us to Matthew 26, 14 through 16. This is obviously the Judas plot, a very well-known section. You know, nobody calls her kid Judas anymore for a good reason. Then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, there is also speculation, and I kind of lean this direction, that this did not happen two days prior to the Passover. That this also is out of chronological order. That this may have happened one or two weeks prior to the situation. So again, it's recorded here, if it is out of chronological order. It's recorded here particularly in order to, to, to kind of get everyone on the same page, that everyone is in alignment and in agreement that Jesus is going to die. So Judas acts upon his plans to profit from his relationship to Jesus. He is not a believer. He is there. He's a keeper of the money box. Now, some opine, thinking that the, uh, that the act of Mary, you, you know, basically wasting the, the perfume, the 300, you know, the, the, the year's wage of perfume upon Jesus was like, okay, that's it. I can't handle this anymore. I did all this waste of money. It didn't say that, but it is, I mean, maybe, but I don't know. They get this from John 12, 4, 6 and 4 through 6, which I agree is he is a greedy thief. But I don't know if the act was done to betray Jesus because he's running out of resources. Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, who was intending to betray him, said, why was his perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he also had the money box and he used to pilfer what was put into it, skimming off the top. Now, if Jesus was a money machine, always getting donations and he was always taking, you know, skimming off the top. I don't, you know, I don't think this is necessarily a catalyst. I think he is just going, OK, how else can I benefit from this? Afterwards, obviously, we know that Judas's plans set in motion the final act that will lead to the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. A couple of final points. What we learn from this, Jesus' plans, the plans of the Sanhedrin, the understanding of Mary, the actions of Judas are all in alignment. This is the point of this action. And the plan of the crucifixion is now solidified and confirmed. Everyone's on the same page. Jesus, in his humanity, because we also know how things play out later on, he sends the one he sends Judas away to go ahead and betray him. He basically is given authority to orchestrate prophetic history. He sets everything in motion. He gives everybody the opportunity to do so. Um, supernaturally, he may have even stealed, okay, the Sanhedrin to do what they wanted to do. Remember, a lot of times the hardening of the heart does not mean that. He put it into their mind to do something. He just gave them the will to accomplish what they wanted to do anyway. But Jesus did not cause. Here's another big thing. Jesus did not cause anyone to do what they did. Judas, the Jews, the Sanhedrin, 
Pilate and the Romans involved are responsible for their choices. They're all held accountable. In fact, even Israel as a whole is held responsible for killing Jesus, even though it's stated that the father planned it from the beginning. So if he planned it, then he, or, then he orchestrated it. No. They could have said, I don't want to kill him. But they said, we want to kill him. And the people, and specifically in Jerusalem, wanted him dead too. Remember, the crowd is not the, the same crowd that was saying Hosanna in the highest. That was the crowd that was following him. The city itself were all in a stir, meaning they were terrified. They were nervous. They didn't want their position taken away either. So once again, Israel is responsible for killing Jesus, even though the father planned it from the beginning. Human responsibility, even though it is known and planned by God. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 23 says this. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, Romans, and put him to death. You're responsible. And they go, oh, man. What do we do now? All right. So hopefully you find this helpful, enriching. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to read ahead. Let's talk about next. We're going to be dealing with the last Passover and the activities of the, both the disciples and Jesus Christ during that time. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word, for your truth, all that you've done for us. It is truly an honor and a privilege to read, to study, and to examine your word to the fullest of our capabilities and to help us to do so. Help us to learn more about you, who you are, what your plans are, your purposes, so that we can communicate more, more appropriately and better to those who need to hear. Help us to build each other up and love, love each other. Help us to continue to pray for the quarrels, for Bob, and we thank you that EV is with you. Help us to be comforting, to show grace and mercy to all. So Jesus, let me pray. Amen.